What's going on guys, it's Bromley from Empire Barbell and today we're gonna to talk about how to peak for a strongman meet. So before we start getting in depth about the principles that go into a proper peak, first we need to talk a little bit about what a peak in a taper actually is. The point of a peak is that if we take into account recovery as we get closer to a meet, two, three weeks before a meet, we can actually pad your existing numbers and increase your performance in a very short period of time. The main principle behind a peak is that fatigue masks fitness. Now I stole that from Mike Israel, but it's a very old concept. So the principle goes something like this. Think of a normal work week. You go into the gym, you're there for two to three hours, you beat yourself into the ground, and then you wake up the next day and do it again. Most of you are training four days a week or more. Most of you are in the gym for an hour and a half to two and a half hours, and you're constantly breaking yourselves down in a bid to get to that next level. So given that fact that you're constantly training, constantly breaking yourself down and trying to adapt, even as you grow, even as you get stronger and your performance goes up, you're never actually going to realize your full strength and potential because you're never actually recovered. So long story short, if we intelligently and deliberately lower the amount of work that you're doing as you get closer to the meet, and we only do the things that are most specific to the competition that you're doing, we can allow for this surge of recovery that's going to allow you to get a lot stronger and perform better in a very short period of time. So there's some misconceptions about what a peak is. I think some people think a peak just means you're lifting heavier, your nervous system is primed for maximal weights. I've heard guys that do systems like Westside talk about how they're always peaking. People that say that shit are either lying or don't know what they're talking about. The concept of a peak has to do with recovery. If there's any period of time where you're working substantially enough to grow, you are going to be in a perpetual state of fatigue. That's just the way it is. The idea behind the peak isn't working with a certain percentage. It's not training one individual capacity. The idea is recovery. Recovery is what's going to lead to your performance. We're not just talking about peaking for a one rep max. We're talking about peaking for a 15 rep max or peaking for a 50 foot sprint or maybe peaking for an endurance medley. We want to finish in under a minute. We have a lot of different qualities. There is no one magical physical quality that refers to a peak. It's certainly not just a one rep max. The peak itself comes from the recovery. As your recovery increases, your performance increases. So let's start with something more simple like powerlifting. In powerlifting, you only have the same three lifts. Now the benefit of that is a much simpler and more straightforward peak. You don't have to worry about a lot of moving parts. It's the same energy systems. It's the same physical characteristics. It's a short maximal effort. You're going for a one rep max. Endurance, speed, and agility are not directly rewarded. You do not need to have high rep endurance. You do not need agility. Even bar speed isn't directly rewarded. It's who moves the weight from point A to point B. They're not putting tendo units on the bar and measuring how fast it goes. So what makes strongman a little trickier is that we have a lot of variety. The lifts in your meets, they're gonna vary every time. And there's five events, not three, which means you have to train for more things all at once. Efforts vary. You might have a maximal event. You might have a rep event. You might have a long endurance medley. You might have a short, fast foot race. You might have a stone series, you might have a stone to height. It varies every single contest. So in the long term, you need to develop all of those capacities. In the short term, you need to know how to cherry pick those qualities and train them specifically and then manipulate them as you get closer to the event so that you can recover properly. All of these qualities, not just strength, but endurance, speed, agility, technical proficiency, those are all key to success. And you have to be good at juggling all of those so that you don't miss a step come contest day. Now this is conceptual, this doesn't correspond to actual numbers, I didn't calculate anything out. This is just the idea I take in when I'm writing out a peak of how these dots line up together. And I can make adjustments as I go so it fits a mold something like this. So the blue line is volume. Technical definition of volume is gonna be something like tonnage, it's gonna be like sets times reps times weight used. Now I know people who are very meticulous and they'll calculate volume out to the pound. Personally, I think that's going overboard the important thing to know about volume is its amount of work. That's a very simple, straightforward way to think about it. When I'm doing basic barbell stuff, I calculate volume just by the number of working sets. If I want to increase volume, I have the person do more working sets. If I want to decrease it, I take the working sets back. It's very easy, it's very straightforward. For the purposes of strongman, it also makes it easy to keep track of moving events. I'm sure there's a formula out there to convert yoke walks and tire flips into tonnage that can be calculated against barbell lifts but I haven't found it and I'm not interested in finding it. I'm interested in easy answers that work. And if you look at volume as just the total amount of work, you can make very easy intuitive changes and reap the same benefits as if you sat down and took eight hours to map out 
the tonnage of every lift from every workout over all of your workouts. So this arrow corresponds to the broad trend that you're looking for over the weeks going into your meet. Volume should have a general trend of a downward slope. Basically, as you get closer to the meet, you wanna be dealing with less volume than you did at the beginning of the meet. Now, I take volume away by reducing the number of working sets for main lifts and by removing accessory work that is not specific to what we're doing. Remember, as you get closer, two, three, four weeks out, you wanna be focusing more and more on specific events, either the events themselves or things that will directly increase those events. So as I get closer and volume starts dropping, I'm taking away things like general bodybuilding movements. In fact, by the time we're about three weeks out, it's usually the main lift that's gonna be in the contest and one or two accessories that are very, very close to the main lift. This represents a normal volume trend I typically follow six or seven weeks out, but you don't even have to do something this complicated. You could do a very linear drop all the way down to the meet where you start with something like six sets and taper down to three, two, or even one set the week before the meet. The important thing is that relative volume drops each week. Now, as volume drops, intensity climbs up. For power lifters, that typically means the percentage of their one rep max. Remember, we have to worry about more than just a one rep max. All of these qualities have to be trained and peaked. So instead of just looking at intensity as the average weight, I look at intensity as the average effort we're putting out. Early on, when you're doing a lot of work, the effort you're putting out on each run is gonna be relatively low. If you're doing six yoke runs, they're not gonna be six of the hardest yoke runs you've ever done. The more total work you do, the less effort you have to put out on each working set. That's just the way it works. So, somewhat relative to the volume we're working with, the average effort you're gonna be doing, exercise to exercise, is going to jump as time goes on. Because your recovery is going to increase, purple right here is recovery, as the volume drops, recovery climbs up. What that means is you can have individual sets where you display more all out efforts. So if you're training for something like a max deadlift, you might have the percentage get closer and closer to your one rep max. If you're training for, let's say a light axle press for reps, or maybe you were starting out with 10 or 12 reps, you can demonstrate more sets where you get closer and closer to your actual rep max. Looking at it conceptually this way makes it easy to apply the same basic template of peaking to multiple events and multiple training thresholds. This is beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. So to make it easier for you, all you need to think about is volume coming down, your effort coming up, and your recovery coming up right along with it. If you can obey this for the four to six weeks before your meet, you will show up meet day fresher and more recovered than you've ever been, and you will have the best performance of your life. If you get to weeks five or six and you start to panic and do a bunch of ego lifting, where all of a sudden the volume kicks up along with the intensity, you're gonna overtrain. You're gonna shoot yourself in the foot, you're gonna show up contest day, and you're gonna wonder why you're not hitting the numbers you did five days before when you were nervously testing them the week of the actual meet. So because we have so many things that we're training for going into a meet, it's important to know which things take longer to recover from and which things take less time to recover from. So I actually wrote them out in a flow chart, starting with the things that are the most difficult to recover from, going all the way down to the easiest. The hardest things to recover from, so the things that you're going to stop doing further out from the meet, are max static lifts. A max deadlift is probably the king of all of these movements when it comes to sapping your recovery. You will not find anybody worth their salt pulling a max deadlift a week before a meet. Now that'll give some of you indigestion waiting that long in between your last heavy training day and the deadlift you're gonna hit at the meet. But trust me, if you push a heavy deadlift any closer to the meet, you're gonna go into the meet fatigued or burnt out. You're gonna have a shitty performance. In fact, there's actually a max deadlift protocol I'm gonna go over with you in just a minute. Same goes for max overhead press. I would even put very, very, very heavy carries in this category. So imagine, you know, you're a 500 pound deadlifter, but you're trying to do a 650 frame carry. For most of you, that's gonna be a very, very heavy carry. If you're fighting out steps, if you're trying to take something that is insurmountably heavy and get to the point where you can carry it a certain distance, that's going to be very, very taxing. And I put that in this category. So these, you're not going to drill the week of the meet. You're gonna stop with your last heavy runs a couple weeks out to allow recovery to kick in. 
Moving down the list, I put medium heavy events. These are events where maybe you can comfortably get a certain amount of distance, but you're not very fast. You tend to drop or stumble. Maybe it's a very heavy tire where you can only get a couple flips in. These are gonna have more of a technical component. And anything with a technical component has to get trained closer to the meet. Now, as we go down the list, we're talking about things for reps, uh, endurance type events. So strength actually hangs around for quite a while, right? So if we stop, let's say two to three weeks before a meet and we don't do any specific strength work, you shouldn't see a decline in your actual strength going into a contest. Endurance, on the other hand, goes away like that. When it comes to longer energy systems, you have to stay on top of those or you're gonna lose a step. So when we're talking about rep events, I would say anything eight reps or more. In fact, if I have an overhead press that goes 10 reps or more, I'll generally do a few high rep sets early in the week of the contest week. Same goes for things like Conan's wheel and Hussafell stone carries, or even a farmer walk for max distance. If you stop two weeks out, you're gonna lose a step. If you time it so that you get some difficult carries the week of, as long as it's to that longer threshold, you can absolutely benefit and maintain that endurance while you still recover from some of the heavier, harder events. The things that take the least out of you with training are very, very speedy events, which if you're an amateur, it is guaranteed that you will come across stupid foot races. Like at the Arnold, they had a 50 foot sprint where everybody got six seconds, 6.1, 6.8, 6.34. 6 Those are very, very fast events that entirely rely on foot speed. Foot speed can be drilled very, very close to a, to a contest. In fact, it should. Very light carries for time, don't take a lot out of you. You can generally do more run-throughs. It's more technical, it's more about precision. Technical movements have to be drilled closer to the meat. So that brings us to purely technical events. These are the ones I call parlor tricks. You generally have to have a high level of proficiency before you're really even able to burn yourself out. So if you're not good with a circus dumbbell, or let's say you're trying to get comfortable with a keg press, at Nationals and the Arnold, they have the standing arm over arm pull which was a very stupid, very technical event. It involves standing up and getting the timing down with your hands. It wasn't very taxing, it wasn't challenging, but it did rely on having very, very precise handwork. Those types of events you can do all the way up to a few days out from the meet. So these are some very broad guidelines. Very heavy static lifts. You're not gonna wanna push more than one to two weeks before the actual meet. Similarly with medium heavy moving events, you wanna get some working closer to the meet but if you have a god awful heavy yoke, you don't wanna drill that seven days before the meet. You wanna push it out a little bit farther. As we get down into rep events, it's really important that you get some type of rep work within the week of the actual meet. That doesn't mean you go in and blow yourself out, but one set to 10 to 15 reps with something around the contest weight is going to make sure that your endurance stays up. Speed events and technical events, again, footwork and speed along with technique, should be drilled as close to the contest as possible. Ideally, you're not doing anything three days before the meet except resting and eating. But the Monday or Tuesday of a Saturday event, it's a really good idea to burn off some nervous energy by doing very, very light run-throughs on some of the faster, lighter, more technical events. So this is a seven-week peak that I wrote out for Andrew Mock. Actually, as of right now, he's about six days out. So it's Sunday right now. So he's about to go into Monday and Tuesday this week before he has California's Strongest Man on this Saturday. So keep in mind, this is something that looks like a strength phase. As we go into the peak, we've already done a lot of volume work. He already did, I think, eight straight weeks of volume where you're talking about six, eight, 10 exercises, four or five or six sets on each one, you know, eight, 10, 12 reps, a lot of high volume work. So this week one, already represents a big drop in volume and a big jump in intensity. Now this is gonna get pronounced as the weeks go on. So the way I like to structure it, or the way I like to structure for him, given the things we had to work on, is we have an upper, sorry, a lower body day, an upper body day, a blended day, and then an event day. Now this is very high frequency. Basically you're working your upper and lower body three times a week. So it can be kind of hard on the joints. So there's certain events I wouldn't recommend this. If you have a bunch of really heavy carry events, you know this will lead up your knees and hips. Um, but if you're going to go high frequency, that's a preferred method. You just have to keep the volume a bit lower on each day. So notice I only got a couple accessory exercises. 
So weekly for the pressing and, and lower body stuff, it only turns out to about 15 working sets, which isn't astronomical. So for the deadlift, there's a max deadlift to California Strongest Man. This is a simple progression I like to run that involves a lot of sub-maximal work and then a last set to failure, and I just increase the percentages as it goes. And then we go into this max effort progression, which allows us to get heavy work in on the deadlift without burning out. If you try to pull 90% or more on a deadlift three to four weeks in a row, you will shit the bed. That's just the way it is. So notice the last heavy deadlift day is a good 12 days out from the contest day the next week, and it's a reverse band. Reverse bands are a good trick to expose your body to heavy weights, practice your setup, practice being explosive while letting your body recover. Reverse bands aren't as hard on your system as straight weight is, especially in a deadlift. So this is one trick I like to employ. I've used this multiple times. We've had a lot of people hit PRs come contest day. I like to go partial deadlift, deficit deadlift, and then a heavy uh, reverse band single from the floor with at least 12 days to recover before you hit your heavy pull. That works like a charm. On the blended day, we're just getting reduced intensity accessory work. This is just a little bit of help. I like pause squats. I like good mornings. I especially like cambered bar good mornings. So this is just an opportunity to get you know, a little more touches on some, some uh, compound hip extension movements. So the other static event is an overhead press medley. Uh, dumbbell, keg, log, axle. So the log and axle are pretty straightforward. The keg and dumbbell are a lot more technical than they are strength-based. So we broke it up on the event days and did a lot of dumbbell and keg work. And then we moved to doing them back to back. So you can practice speed in the context of a little bit of fatigue and with a sense of urgency to make sure you don't fall apart. Andrew was a very, very good jerker. He has a really good push jerk, but it wasn't much better than his, or it was a lot better than his push press, but not because his jerk was so good and so technical. It was because his pressing strength was relatively low. So to address that, I switched him to a push press and we did a lot of lockout work. Overhead pin presses are good. Uh, log push presses, uh, close grip incline with chains, some accommodating resistance to help the lockout. And he exploded. As of this this week right here, he did uh, 90%. I actually had him bump that up based off his working sets. Um, so he actually ended up doing 15 pounds over his old push press PR for four reps. So we went from 260 for a single to 275 for four. So that means he's going to be a lot more sure going into the overhead press medley. Um, it means the weights are going to feel lighter. He's going to be able to move more deliberately and faster. And if he, if he fatigues, he doesn't have this narrow margin of error if he doesn't stick the lockout. So he's able to recover so much better if he's a little off on his lockout. So that's a, a big game changer. A heavy overhead event, you can do a little closer. That's why I put it second in the week. So this is 10 or 11 days out. And then down here, he does 90% contest weight run through, and that's a week out. So you can you can hit the overhead stuff a little closer to the meat, just as long as it's not ball busting. Um, if he was going into a max overhead press, I wouldn't have a really heavy overhead press a week before I'd push it out a little bit further. So the other events, uh, we'll talk about the keg toss. So the keg toss is... It's technical, but it's technical like making an omelet is technical. You have to do it right, but most people can figure it out pretty quick. If you have someone who knows what they're talking about watching you, most people can figure out a keg toss setup in a pretty short period of time. So this goes under the fast explosive type event and highly, or uh, sorry, predominantly technical event because it's mainly transition time. It's mainly getting your swing right. So it doesn't take a lot out of you. And for that reason, we can do it closer to the meet. So we have the full run through actually the week before the meet. We started with banded kettlebell swings because it's a good analog to keg tosses and it doesn't require all the annoying setup of taking everything outside, getting a scaffolding set up. Andrew's 6'3", which is atypical for a middleweight. He's very explosive. He finished the bag toss like a half second behind Anthony Furman. This is a fantastic event for him. So when you're really good at something, you spend less time on that. You spend more time on the things you suck at. That's, that's what you do. So we saved the keg toss run through for just a couple weeks before so he could practice timing and transition because for him, that's what's going to win it. It's going to be how, not whether or not he can toss all the kegs. It's how quick he gets through it. Um, so going into some medium uh, moving events, actually endurance-based moving events. The farmer walk for California is, is 150 feet total, 
75 feet on thin handles, uh, 75 feet on fat handles. So grip is a factor. 150 feet total is long for a farmer's walk, so endurance is a factor. Uh, this is another one. We're doing full run-throughs the week before because endurance is a factor. 150 feet quickly with your grip fatiguing. If we were to stop this too far out, maybe the week before, he would be deconditioned going into the contest. So this one ran a little bit closer. Early on, we're varying the weights. We're doing uh, you know, shorter runs, then longer runs, slowly adapting him to the workload. Then we're doing percentage of contest weights. Then eventually we did the actual contest weight. Again, Andrew has a nasty grip. Like this was going to be a good event for him regardless. He just has to work on, again, transition and foot speed. And those are things we want closer to the meet. Uh, lastly, there were stones. Andrew's a fantastic stone loader. So I wasn't going to prioritize a bunch of endless stone loading, knowing he could clear the series out in the beginning when he signed up. So he got some token reps here. As the weeks went on, it got more and more specific to the series. And then eventually we got to the point where he was doing the full run through. He'd do one run through, he'd dust it in 20 seconds. We're like, okay, that's good for today. Why waste any more energy when we can spend more of that energy recovering from press and deadlift work? And that's pretty much how that went. So uh, no, just a, a broad uh, explanation of the pattern I like to go through. Um, when I start a new phase, I like to start relatively lower volume to adapt to the exercises and the frequency and the order of everything. And then going into the next week, I like to bump it up. So notice the number of working sets increased across all of the main compound exercises. We went from three to five sets on a lot of things, five to, uh, four or five sets of accessories. So volume starts low, then goes up, and then steadily starts dropping again. And then by the time we get to week five and six, we straight up took these days out and we really hacked down the accessories. So this is the point where recovery should just be going up, 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 up as you get closer to the contest week. Now this is huge right here. This is huge because this is where everybody screws up. This is the week of the meet. Notice how absolutely easy these days are. Three sets of five at 65% for uh, push press and squat couple sets of back extensions, couple sets of body weight exercises. This is busy work. This is to burn nervous energy. If you go in and get anything that looks like a substantial workout the week of the meet, you are not peaking. You are setting yourself up to be fatigued on contest day. You might be strong, you might do well, but you will not be peaked, okay? Remember, fatigue masks fitness. The point of this week is not to fuck yourself up. You are not going to get stronger by doing heavy squats or presses, all you are going to do is fatigue yourself and end up on contest day fatigued and not peaked. A proper peak means being fully recovered. That is the point of all of this. So this is just a rough guideline. Remember, you're not gonna do a ton in seven weeks with the exception of getting yourself familiar with the events and really not messing yourself up. This was part of a longer, I think it was all in all like a, a 12 or 14 week contest prep that he did because he knew he was going to do these events three, four months out from the contest. So piecing everything together intelligently, making decisions ahead of time, not based off emotion or what you feel like lifting that day, but on paper. So you know what you're going to do before you do it. That's the key to having a successful contest. The people that do this right, including myself and many of the athletes that I take care of, they are meticulous. Emily Elliott's one of the most disciplined, meticulous lifters I've ever met. She gets her training from Nick Romero from House of Power, and she follows everything to the T. She does not improvise. She does not make changes. She does what's written on the paper. And every contest she does just gets more. She's a robot. She gets more meticulous, more mechanical, more automated with every event that comes in. And she just got her pro card at the Arnold. She's now a pro lightweight woman. Sorry, lightweight women strongman. And uh, this last contest looked like the easiest. It looked like she'd done it a million times. She breezed through everything because she was the exact right mix of practiced, recovered, and conditioned. And it showed. So get a plan, follow it, tweak it as you need it. Uh, for some of you that are new to programming, I strongly advise finding a coach to do this for you. If you don't, then you better be good at learning as you go. Take notes, man, pay attention. Every time you put something in, ask yourself, why is it there? Is that gonna benefit me or is that gonna shoot me in the foot? When in doubt, get a trained eye. You're more than welcome to take this and apply it if you want. 
depending on what contest you have, obviously you're going to have to make changes. This is just for Andrew. Um, there's no cookie cutter. Even if, I would not give the same template to another person doing California's Strongest Man because I know Andrew's strengths. I know what he needs to work on, what he's good at, and I know what he needs what he needs to build up. You know, everybody has different weaknesses. Everybody has to organize around what they're good at and what they can recover from. And that's where having a trained eye comes in. You know, no two people are alike. So know yourself, be objective, leave emotion out of it. But if you can get good at managing your peaks and preparing for contests in a deliberate, intelligent fashion, not only are you going to do well at the meets, but you are going to keep yourself in one piece. And that's the most important part.